My name is Andrew Connors. I'm the curator of art here at the Albuquerque Museum, and it is an incredible honor for me to introduce our next speaker, Pablo de Guerra. Is an artist, although to call him simply an artist categorizes himself in a way that um, is incredibly limiting. Uh, the diversity of his mind, the way that his mind expands and takes us with it on adventures uh, throughout the creative world is truly astounding. Um, he it has worked in installation, sculpture, photography, drawing, socially engaged art, and performance. His work focuses and responds to a variety of topics, ranging from history, sociolinguistics, ethnography, memory, and the absurd, in formats that are widely varied, including the lecture, museum display strategies, musical performance, and written fiction. Uh, he not only writes and composes music, uh, he performs music, um, he is constantly challenging our definitions of what art and creativity can be. Uh, he has performed with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Uh, he has uh, given performances and lectures uh, in Germany, in Switzerland, in the United Kingdom, here in the United States, in Japan, in Buenos Aires, in Mexico City. Uh, he was born in Mexico City, 1971. Uh, and his range of creativity is truly astounding. If you have not uh, seen his three volumes of publications of art tunes, um, art uh, flavored cartoons, uh, you are in for a treat in reevaluating and re estimating the way that we think of our profession. Uh, one of my favorites of his art tunes uh, is a man sit, uh, standing in a living room with a couch. There's a painting on the wall, and it says, That theory doesn't match my sofa. <laughs> Which sounds simple, but it is so loaded. It is so loaded, like so many of the things that Pablo is working on in so many different ways. Uh, we will be thrilled to be able to witness one of his performances in Santa Fe on July 18th when he opens the site Santa Fe Biennial at the uh, San Miguel Mission Church uh, with a performance, a new piece, a, a new work uh, that he has been working with site Santa Fe on for the past two years. It is a great honor to be provoked uh, and to be inspired by this great thinker, Pablo Higuera, who in his spare time is the director of adult programming at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, a full-time job in addition to his creativity. Uh, what an astounding individual. I can't wait to hear the words that come out of his mouth. Thank you. <laughs> about hailing this new kind of art that we were always looking toward the future. But 
I believe, but having such a strong uh, reflection on how we <coughs> connect with that and get past <coughs> with the history of art and uh, and uh, the uh, circumstances where, it, where one makes that art. Uh, something that one eventually has to deal with sooner or later, regardless of where one lives in and regardless of what kind of art one makes. So this is the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of digital Latin America. The need to understand the issues that uh, are uh, common of Latin America and of Latino culture in the United States. And by the way, when I, I'm going to refer to Latin America or Latin American artists, I'm always thinking of Latino artists in the US. I don't see a big distinction between the two things. I think we are part of the same dialogue, at least in my life I've seen that relationship. Um, there are about three main issues that I often think about that uh, we need to contend with when we are dealing with Latin America from contemporary art practice. Um, at least as, see, as, as, as I see them right now. Um, these include the idea of thriving in adversity uh, by embracing the popular. And I'll, I'll go back to each one of these. Uh, situating or eccentricity, and redefining individuality. So I'll go from the Neutronomies. In 1967, a Brazilian artist, Elio Itisica, wrote a very influential manifesto where he stated the goals of his art. And he also reflected on the realities of being an artist in the developing world. His famous phrase from that text was the adversidade vivemos, which literally means we live from adversity or you can understand it as adversity fuels or creativity. Uh, the challenges that our everyday life presents uh, are also opportunities. <clears throat> in this particular piece, uh, in Portuguese, it says, become marginal, become a hero. Uh, this was an idea, this kind of ideas were floating, were floating in, the, in the 60s in Brazil and in other parts of Latin America. Uh, but in there, uh, they led to a movement called tropicalismo or tropicalia, which was expressed uh, by most, most uh, noticeably uh, in the music uh, world through the work of the musicians Catano Veloso and Gilberto Gil. Uh, and uh, when they uh, created this work, uh, this, this movement of tropicalia emerged during uh, a, uh, a moment in Brazil that was veering into a military dictatorship. Um, for Veloso and Gil, it was very important to actually make an art that uh, would embrace the vernacular. That instead of making an art that would be, let's say, uh, 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 for an elite or for a particular uh, for a reduced group of people, that it would have to embrace everybody. And uh, that's how Bossa Nova was born. It was a kind of, of uh, an echo of nationalist movements in Latin America, um, like Mexican muralism, that contended at the time in the 30s that when you make art uh, that is uh, national, it is also contemporary. That there was no distinction between those two things, which is what led to social realism and things like that. And in Chicano art, uh, the thing that one would be most familiar with would be rasuachismo, like the, 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 the thing that you make art with basic means, uh, the art that you make uh, that is uh, easy to make, that it's, you, you make art with whatever you have at hand. And uh, conceptually, it also means that you make art with the images that are most familiar with us uh, in our society. So you use Superman, you use Mickey Mouse, you use, and you use the, in, like in the case of Enrique Chavo, it's always a, that, that uh, encounter of, of American popular culture and uh, pre-colonial culture. But how does this really manifest in the 90s, let's say, uh, when the internet starts and so on and so forth, uh, in the, the work of Latin American, uh, let's say, post-minimal conceptual artists? Um, so when you look at the work of Gabriel Orozco, a Mexican artist, who came to prominence in the, in the early 90s, you can see how this question is addressed in a very different way. Uh, uh, Orozco makes very simple gestures that uh, uh, in some of his photographs, this is a photograph of Orozco where he basically takes, goes into a market, finds these images of cat food, and just places them on, on the, the watermelons and takes this, this picture. You know? uh, which he would, have, he would have to say that it's very poetic, but I think it is very poetic. Um, and um, and there are like images that, that usually um, 
refer to, to context that, uh, that you can see in a market anywhere in Latin America or, or images that you can find anywhere in Latin America. What, it, what I think is actually happening that he's doing is he's drawing from two traditions. Uh, he's drawing from, from uh, something similar to Arte Povera, which is to the left, uh, art, art by artists who, uh, that emerged in Italy in the 60s, artists who were making art with whatever means they had to make it. Uh, and also the, the art of kind of like the found image that is very common in Latin America, like a tradition by artists like Álvarez Oral, where you, you're walking down, and I think if you have been to Latin America, you'll know what I mean. Um, this is what uh, prompted Andre Breton to say when he visited Mexico. Well, you, in France, we had to invent surrealism, but you, you guys in Mexico already had it organically. It already exists. You know? So you don't need to do anything. You just show up to the streets and it's already there. <laughs> and uh, so the Alvarez Bravo images like that, that image of the optica with the, with the eye, etc., becomes already like a metaphor, but it's simply kind of isolating the, in the frame of the picture. So, so what, what Orozco is actually doing with that, with that work is essentially uh, using the, those strategic conceptual means of Arte Povera, uh, placing uh, these objects that tell us about a particular, the, the particular um, uniqueness and oddity and familiarity of a particular place. Yeah. And, and it is the feeling that while you're looking at something that maybe could be anywhere, but it's also not just anywhere, it's, it's very much it's connected to, to a Latin American tradition. Um, if you look at the generation of artists that come immediately after Orozco, which is my generation, <clears throat> um, there's an aspect of, of, of uh, contemporary art strategies that kind of version the ethnographic. Uh, and that verge on basically going into the urban realities of the cities and uh, or, or Latin American culture and then doing, some, doing a commentary on that that might relate anywhere from popular culture to, uh, to telenovelas to, uh, to, to police brutality. Or in the case of Daniela Rosell, who was a, a photographer at that time, uh, the, the private lives of, uh, of her of rich individuals. In uh, this, this uh, series called Ligas y Famosas, Rosel goes into the, inside the house of uh, the, the Mexican plutocracy and the daughters of some of the richest uh, families in Mexico, uh, who basically uh, create this uh, picture of themselves and their palaces, which is at the same time ridiculous and funny and strange, and, and, uh, and a portrait of a society, uh, of, of a sector of society that usually is never seen uh, by, by the larger series. So, so when this picture came up, uh, there was an enormous uh, kind of scandal or uproar of seeing like the, the ridiculousness of, of, the, of, the, the, kind of the, the cheesy luxury of the rich families lived. You know? <clears throat> and, uh, and, he, and, he raised, and he also raised a lot of questions of the good relation between the viewer <laughs> and the photographer because these, the, these girls were actually uh, in a way complicit exhibiting their own, uh, um, the, their own lives without realizing how they were actually portraying themselves. You know? <clears throat> so it's very interesting. So there's a question that starts emerging here, which, uh, which is what I'm actually going to get to now, which is what, who is the audience for these things? Who is really supposed to be looking at this stuff? You know? um, Aníbal López is a conceptual artist from Guatemala that I it's, it's a, perhaps one of the leading conceptual artists in Guatemala today. Uh, his work is very drastic and very radical, uh, very powerful, and can be very disturbing at times. Um, I remember him saying, saying one time in a conversation we were having that for him, uh, the actions that he makes, he makes conceptual art actions in Guatemala and other places, that, he, that implicate individuals as, as, as kind of involuntary participants. Uh, so that he's not interested in the participants themselves. That the, the work is not for them, the work is for like the gallery viewer. So in other words, the work is for the art world. So what, what he does here is that he, he takes this enormous garbage truck and then puts like all these books and then he dumps them in the middle of the street. And then people coming to grab the books become kind of like part of the piece as he's photographing the piece, you know? So, <clears throat> so in the various cases that I have brought up, um, there's a question, again, of, of who is the, the viewer, who's that outside viewer, you know? And there's a, um, there's a kind of a reality about working in uh, that outside or that periphery the, the, of, of the central capitals of the art world, let's say, that you are making work in that, that ethnographic term, that the work that you're making 
uh, has that outside audience, that international audience. And then that the others, the ones that are implicated in that, like the rich girl or like the, uh, or like the, the people on the street or indigenous or not, etc., they become performers of that lens. And the role of the artist becomes of the mediator, uh, if not a presenter of those realities to a third party. <clears throat> so it's something that, it's an issue that we need to ask ourselves, you know, how, how do we continue resolve, how do we resolve this in today's time? You know, how, how, how do we, how, does, how do artists need to position themselves in a world where that is not mediated anymore through, because it's mediated directly through technology? So those are the questions that are now emerging thanks to technology. But first, let me go to the other topic, which is eccentricity. And I also already alluded to it because of the notion of periphery. So there's always been something eccentric uh, from the outside about Latin America. Obviously, it's not eccentric for those who are from Latin America, but it's from those who are outside. But there's the perception from the outside about Latin America is that it is an eccentric place. That essentially, um, that it's an extension of the Western world, but it's not the Western world. You know, you, you might see, you might be in a capital that feels a lot like, uh, like you might be in like downtown like some city, and it feels a lot like Madrid, but it's not. There's no, there's there's a there's a, there's a syncretism uh, of cultures, uh, of Colombian, Native American art. There's all these things that that, that, that are placed there, uh, that that are. Uh, joined with the realities of a Western look. Um, uh, but so what does that mean when you actually are talking about art? <clears throat> so Latin America has always been actually a region that's been in the 20th century at the forefront of the American culture. And it's actually really important to remember that the term modernismo uh, was actually born in Nicaragua. It was not born in Europe. It was first used in the, in the, in the, in the actual sense, in the 20th century sense in uh, Nicaragua through the work of this man, who is Ruben Darío. He uh, was uh, a poet, you know, from Nicaragua, and his writings were, um, uh, became the first uh, uh, example of an artistic movement, and the first artistic movement uh, that uh, officially came from, from, the, from Europe, in the, in the Western tradition. So when, uh, long before the whole notion of modernism was established in the 20th century. It's really about the, the end of the 19th century. <clears throat> so, um, so this is like a, uh, so what happens is like the art of Latin America has all these strengths, but also the weaknesses of being perceived, of being from outside. Uh, the art that is unusual, the whole idea that that's art that looks at reality from a particular lens, that uh, fits with the requirement of the artist as an outsider, but from a certain distance. Um, but the, what that means, in terms of its weaknesses, is that it operates from a place where instinctively it looks for an interlocutor that is not there, that is not physically there, that is far away, that is imagined, that reacts or counters the center, but in the end it continues to be attached to the center. The center being the canonical art history of 20th century art the English term modernism. So in Latin America, this is why we normally are credited by making art that thrives in eccentricity, from the surrealism of Frida Kahlo to the magical realism of Garcia Marquez. So we, we, we always are told that we, cannot, we can come up with amazing imagination, imaginary, and uh, exotic things, you know? But we are never given enough credit through our ideas. In other words, we're always often seen as poets, but not as thinkers. We are, uh, Latin America is perceived as a place of, of dancing and food in the, in the, in the most uh, stereotypical way, of exoticism and beaches, but not a place where serious work gets done. This, of course, is a gross stereotype that nonetheless is, sort of, is generalized and promoted by, you know, right? So, now, I will speak about the individual, which is not an issue that relates to Latin America exclusively, but it's a, it's a reality of the output. And I live in New York City, you know, where uh, we are kind of, I mean, I, 
it, it's just very odd to see what's going on right now with her. <laughs> so you probably know who this guy is. This is James Franco, who recently had a show, because he, now he's an artist. Okay. He's an artist. <laughs> and uh, he, um, he decided to make a series of photographs that were shown at his gallery, where he poses imitating, he does like remakes of a famous series by Cindy Sherman, the famous American photographer, uh, they call the film stills. The, the, it's a series of photographs from the 70s where <coughs> Sherman poses herself in, uh, in these really interesting scenarios that appear to be from films, where she's basically uh, performing out the entire repertoire of this, the, let's say, the, the, the stereotypes of women in, the, in film. <coughs> And uh, so Franco basically talks, takes on this thing and starts performing himself. Um, and uh, uh, the, perhaps the best commentary about Cindy Sherman, uh, the, best, the best commentary about these pieces was maybe by Cindy Sherman who said, um, well, I don't know if these ones are really art. I don't know if you can really call these things art. But I find it weird that the gallery showed it that, that he made them. In, in other words, um, we are, we're living a moment where art, you know, we know everybody can be an artist, but now even celebrities can be artists. Right? Um, another thing that kind of uh, rocked the art world was Jay-Z's uh, video, Picasso Baby, where he decided to, to do it at a, at a Manhattan gallery and bring Marina Abramovich as well as other artists to perform with him. You know? so, um, the, so we are in a process in which the, the work has been dematerialized, but the artist um, the figure of the artist by now has really been reduced to the construction of a brand. Yeah. And, um, and that's when things get really complicated. Uh, There's a, a piece by Francesco Vezzoli, which is essentially a perfume. So he's, a, he's another Italian artist who's very obsessed with celebrity. And it's kind of like the legacy of Andy Warhol. Um, so it's, it's kind of one of the strands of, of the contemporary art world, you know, like what, uh, how do we really relate to that world of, of immediate fame and of celebrity, and uh, how do we be critical of that? Now, you can imagine, for an artist who lives in Latin America, or an artist with Latin America, how do you reconcile doing pictures in drag with things like this? How do you reconcile the plight of millions uh, of immigrants and people with this fate with things like pop culture, you know, uh, and with this kind of society that treats some individuals like the plague, you know? I just want to reemphasize this because this is really difficult sometimes to take, and I'm sorry about the graphic nature of these images, but to me, the art world is in a particular place. It, and, and I don't want to say the entire art world, but the art market. You know? This is where the art market is, and this is where we are. You know, what, what, what do you do when uh, our historical tradition has come to this, and there are the urgent issues in our society that we need to address when you're an artist, whether you are in or not in other words. So, let's go back and talk about the digital part. Something very important happened three weeks ago. Uh, Subcomandante Marcos announced his retirement from the Ejército Zapatista through a very important event on Community Day on May 24th. I'm going to quote a few things from Marcos. He said, it is our conviction and our practice that we don't need leaders or chieftains, messiahs or saviors, in order to raise up and fight. Only a little humility, a lot of teaching, and a great deal of organization. The rest either serves the collective or it is useless. So there won't be a museum house or metal plaques where I lived and grew up. Nor will there be anyone living who used to be Solomon and the Marcos. No one will inherit his name or position. There won't be any all expense patriots to give speeches abroad. There will be no, there'll be no transfer of air in luxurious hospitals. There'll be no windows or airs. There'll be no funerals or honors or statues or museums or prizes or anything that the system does not enhance the cult of individual and the value of the collective. So that's how Subcomandante Marcos says goodbye. 
by essentially doing something that I think um, uh, is an hour, which is um, erasing himself. And I think the reason why I bring him up, not only because of the historical moment right now, is because it is very important to remember that Zapatismo was the first insurgency that used the web as a tool. It was essentially born with the web uh, as a global uh, phenomenon in 1994. Um, and it was precisely mass media that gave Zapatistas the strength and allowed them to share their cause with the rest of the world. As an army, they could not have withstood like uh, a government army, but because they were able to play a media campaign that were so strong and so immediately uh, capable to create the sympathy, the global sympathy that emerged uh, all over the world, it made it impossible for the Mexican government to come and uh, outright uh, eliminate the Zapatista movement. So, <clears throat> so the creation of the figure of Marcos is not unlike an arm. Uh, the formation of a mythical figure that rises the hopes and aspirations of millions of people. The greatest gesture of Marcos, if indeed he's able to complete it, is to make that uh, himself disappear. So you, you can see the uses of two ways of technology. The, the, the completely mediatized, the, the, the commercial, the, the for-profit creation of an idea that actually is nothing other than a brand, and that it's really, it does not create any other incentive other than following the brand, consuming the brand, or using technology to, to build toward an ideal, an ideal that might be impossible to attain, but that can make other people to act, and to act in a more immediate manner in the, in the world that they live in, uh, to, to create, try to create a better world. Those are the things that I think are very important to think about when we are looking at uh, the place where we work, the, let's say that our relationship with individualism and, and the tradition of individuality that uh, capitalism and, and uh, an art usually has uh, attached to, to our making. <clears throat> now I will just uh, very quickly talk about some of uh, personal experiences or I guess uh, projects that I've done that have uh, also led me to, I guess, uh, gain some of these insights uh, regarding what I just talked about. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, let me just be very quick because we don't have much time. But, um, one of the projects that completely changed my way of, uh, of thinking about Latin America uh, and, uh, and basically of art and education in general was a project called the School of Pan American Unrest. It was essentially a, an attempt to create a dialogue between nations, uh, uh, seeing that in America, which is a large uh, continent, uh, uh, and not just Latin America, but also uh, North, North America and Anglo America, there's very little discussion uh, about uh, joint cultural traditions and, um, and the, whole, the whole idea of nationhood. Uh, so I started a series of workshops that, uh, that were intended to to ask people to reflect on what it meant to live uh, in, in the Americas, uh, what it meant to be American in the larger context of the world. And uh, what the project became was essentially a road trip uh, under, in which I drove from uh, Alaska to Chile. It was 25,000 miles. Uh, it's easier said than done. But, uh, uh, and I had no idea what I was doing when I thought, when I announced I was going to do it. But, you know, uh, and uh, I essentially built a, uh, a, a temporary structure, a schoolhouse-like structure. Because to me, it was very important to create an autonomous space within which uh, these discussions will happen. <clears throat> uh, at each location, there was like a very structured series of events uh, that would uh, include um, a panel discussion um, with locals on the subject of their choosing. Uh, a series of programming within the art school, within the school, uh, that included uh, films and such, and, uh, and interviews, um, as well as a, a performance. Uh, and I will explain that in a minute. Uh, another thing that I, that I was doing through my, through the course of my trip, was uh, interviewing last speakers of languages. It's an, an ongoing interest of mine, uh, and uh, my, my project started with an interview with who was the, first, the last speaker of the IAC language, Mary Smith-Jones, who already passed away. A very powerful woman 
who was the leader of her, uh, for uh, well, the descendants of the of the of the EX, and um, and uh, and who really represented in a way that part of, of the continent that is truly vanishing, that is not, that is irreplaceable, the specificity of culture that only a language provides. So the, the project itself was we'll say it will be very difficult to describe in just five minutes. Basically, it was an, uh, a four-month trip uh, that really uh, embraced all the romanticism of the road trip, the romanticism of all the journeys through the Americas, from from Humboldt to the missionaries to the beat poets to to million other, to the Che driving the in the uh, in South America on his, on his motorcycle and such, and um, each each encounter because of the road trip made it very meaningful uh, to encounter other artists. And um, the main ob objective was to produce declarations that were written together by, by, by local artists and, uh, and uh, citizens. Uh, I would come to them and say, well, if you were to do a declaration about what, what are the issues of your particular city, and how, what would you do to resolve and what would you write? So we would do these very kind of uh, serious ceremonies where the declaration for each city would be read. And of course, you know, I wrote this Pan-American anthem, and uh, that people would sing as well. I mean, basically, I wanted to create this, this idea of, of Pan-America. What, what would we like to actually construct together consciously to this called Pan-America? And um, it was the discussions that really fueled the project uh, more than the actual fuel, but <laughs> the, the, the van well, that was also pretty important, and it was very expensive at the time when I did the project with, with the, the gas. Um, <clears throat> And you know, it, it's a project that, that had um, successes and failures. You know, it, uh, it was it became difficult to say when the south and come through through New Mexico. That was my first encounter, in fact, with New Mexico. That was a really wonderful experience. Um, and um, and I think every every city, and especially uh, crossing Mexico, things started getting complicated. You know? um, but um, overall, it was a um, a project that that. that as, as, as it traversed the, the Americas, it, it, whether it was art or not, it didn't really matter anymore. You know, it was it was really a project about putting people, uh, creating a network of people. And I have to say that it's also a very important detail on this project. That the project happened in 2006. It was uh, it, it actually had returned from the trip uh, weeks before Facebook was launched. Uh, and as well, I think on the month where Twitter was launched. So this is this is a pre-social media <laughs> artwork. <laughs> I think that if I did it again, uh, oh, well, which I'm never going to do it again, <laughs> uh, I would uh, it would be very different if actually you were using social media. But this was kind of like the, a way to like imagine uh, how you really put like different cities in how those Puebla language uh, or like Albuquerque and many that would have conversation. You know. um, <clears throat> And, um, and how symbolic gestures can become meaningful in, in different local environments. Uh, of course, it was also about the territory. It was about the, the physicality of, of making, making experiences real. Uh, because the, the problem, of, of course, with technology and with neutrality is that you, you think you already have experience, but you did it. You know, it's very different, uh, even for us to now usually fly everywhere if you will travel to, to a distant place, to understand what a real border means. And I realized by this, in this experience that orders um, are really for, for, for the dispossessed, for the people who don't have the means, you know, that have to travel by land. And it's a privilege to actually cross um, um, by flying. And, um, and what was really also a little inspiring, I guess, was the, the fact that all these communities of artists were there, uh, <clears throat> very uh, excited to have a conversation. Uh, places where um, uh, resources were scarce uh, prompted a lot of creativity. Artists like, like these ones in Nicaragua, the, the, the local museum will not accept their art, so they will have to rent a porn theater to show their videos. <laughs> but it was such, such an interesting event. Um, well, of course, my trip really dealt a lot with bureaucracy. That was like another thing that I that almost uh, that, that, well, basically got me more than anything else, and uh, as well as the the violence of the borders, and the, the, sort of the realities of living in Latin America, you know, the, especially traversing uh, Colombia. Uh, it, it did happen to me in Colombia, uh, where uh, I was able to be at Bolivar's house. Uh, when I was crossing the border of Bolivia and, uh, I'm sorry, the Colombia and, um, and Venezuela, uh, that 
that uh, I had a crash with the bus and I almost landed in jail in that small town of, of Kukuta. You know? uh, so this, these were like the basically uh, life events that started shaping the project. But um, it started also happening that when it was arriving to places, the entire communities were really ready to, to take over and, uh, and uh, make this uh, project happen. When I arrived to Asuncion, for example, I, I, I did not have this, this schoolhouse anymore with me because it was stuck in a, in a, in a, in a border. So they decided to build a school together. And, uh, and the children that, 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 that became part of the project, they were actually, they, they were, they were did it in a shanty town, next to a shanty town. They were excited that they would finally have a school. Um, anyway, um, it, it's a, it was a very, very long project, but um, only to say that at the very end of the project, when I arrived to Ushuaia, uh, which is the end uh, of the, the, the very tip of the continent in Argentina, um, and I crossed the Beagle Channel uh, to, to get to the southernmost part of the world, which is Puerto Williams in Chile. It's essentially a military base uh, to defend these little islands that really have absolutely nothing. It's just rocks, I don't know why you need to defend them. But, um, uh, at the last house of the last uh, road uh, at the end of the world, she lived this woman, whose name was Cristina Calderón. She's the last speaker of the uh, the people of Tierra del Fuego, and she's still alive. Uh, so when I was able to reach her, I knew that my journey had finally ended. Uh, or let's say, had basically concluded for the moment, and then opened up a number of new questions as to you know what is it that really brings us together? You know, what are the networks that we can count on that can make us uh, be more fully integrated? And how we can use technology uh, and, and the resources today, you know, with its with its uh, uh, challenges and its and its obstacles to really gain a better understanding of who we are with each other. I will just present one last project before I conclude. Um, just to, to fast track to the present and how some of these have informed the things that I do um, uh, in, in terms of how I think of Latin America. This is a project that uh, is called Libreria Los Celes. It's, it's still one of my most important projects that I'm working on right now. Um, starting with, um, in Latin America, there's a lot of musical stores. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I'm from Mexico City. Uh, in downtown Mexico City, there's a street called Los Celes, uh, which is in downtown. It's one of the oldest streets in the Americas. Uh, it's right behind the cathedral. And um, it's in, in downtown Mexico City, every street is kind of dedicated to a particular thing. So if you want to buy a wedding dress, you go to Republica de Honduras. If you want to buy a radio, you go to Republica de Santo you want to find toothbrushes and you go to these other places. Um, <laughs> and if you want to buy these books, you go to those things. And, um, and um, this is where I kind of grew up and where I became passionate about knowledge. The whole idea that you could walk into a place, and that's not, you know, I didn't have any money, so I would just, you know, have five, five or ten pesos and just walk into these places and get lost for hours, browsing, not knowing what I was looking for until I found it. Um, and uh, living in New York, uh, you may or may not know that uh, there's two million Spanish speakers in New York City. That's a fourth of the entire population of New York City. Just think about two million people. Um, that's a lot of people. And there's not a single Spanish bookstore in New York City. Uh, you may also know that, uh, or be aware, that use the bookstores in general are a species in extinction. You know, we, are, we have less and less bookstores. Everything is done online. Uh, used bookstores, well, forget it, and there's even less of that. Uh, and um, we are, in a weird way, arriving into this world where we practically are going to have no access to printed materials. <clears throat> so I was thinking a lot about, about that in New York, and, and I was inspired by a, an example of a poet, uh, Jose Juan Tablada, a Mexican poet, who in 1921, he opened a bookstore in New York City called Libreria de los Latinos. Uh, it was a terrible business, and he went out of business in no time. Um, but it was a wonderful and very idealistic um, 
project, and I wanted to to do something like that. Uh, if we fail, you know, at least I'll be in good company. <laughs> um, so I did, I went to Mexico City, and uh, and I started a campaign of compiling book, used books. Because in Mexico City, people usually don't have a lot of mobility. You stay in the same house where you've been there forever, or where your grandmother and your mother lived. Or, so everybody has a lot of books um, that they want to get rid of. And, um, and I started exchanging artwork with for, for, for books. Uh, it was uh, at first it was I realized I will never I will never get enough books. For, I started with like ten books. You know, I don't think I'm gonna can't have a bookstore with ten books. Um, I, I started the calling newspapers and tried to get the word out. Finally, a newspaper there published a story that I was doing this campaign, and then everything changed. Then. I had hundreds of people calling, bringing books. Uh, people from all walks of life, uh, perfect teachers, doctors, secretaries, children, bringing their own children's books, um, artists, anthropologists, um, lawyers, uh, people from all walks of life, older, younger, female, men. It was, it was an incredible, incredible response. Uh, and soon I was confronted by daily arrivals of things like this. You know? <laughs> uh, I had a friend whose uh, parents' house were, he had a big house, so they said we can put the books there. But then the, his parents were very happy with me <laughs> after a few uh, weeks. Uh, in in uh, three weeks, we uh, amassed 25,000 books uh, of every possible uh, topic you could imagine. So my rule was essentially, as long as it's in Spanish, I'll take it. I don't care what it is, you know. So I had anatomy, astrology, astronomy, astronomy, um, uh, novels, horror, horror novels. I had uh, an entire long library of a person. Uh, I had books from the 20s, from the 30s, from the 19th century. I, I had textbooks of every kind, psychology, you name it. Um, so then started the, the project of really fundraising to bring out the books, which is really the real problem. It's a shipping problem, a shipping nightmare. You know, uh, essentially one to two dollars per book. You know, so if you think twenty-five thousand books, you know, you're talking about fifty thousand dollars shipping costs. You know? That's why you don't have a used bookstore anymore, right? <laughs> so uh, I did open in September of 2013, and I'm the only used Spanish bookstore, the only Spanish bookstore in New York. Um, and uh, things like, you know, when you go to, to places, I don't know how it is in Albuquerque, but if you go to, you know, to places like Barnes & Noble and you look for the Spanish section, uh, at least in New York, you, the only thing that you find is things that are like New Age, uh, religion, cooking, maybe, maybe two or three novels, and then translations of, of Stephen King, you know. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's what is seen, this is what I was talking about, like the perceptions of, of Latino culture. Why not have uh, books in psychology? Why not have books in history? You know, uh, and this is what Nocelles was about. You know, uh, it was uh, it was a, a massive bookstore with a lot of books from every possible kind of theater, literature, uh, and then I kind of created my own categories. You know, I said you know books that books that are terrible. They, they're terrible books. <laughs> uh, I did a uh, books with beautiful covers. You know, nice covers, which there were amazing covers there. Um, um, books that you buy in the subway because there's usually people selling. So that there was like a subway literature, and there was like there was a section called outdated Marxism. <laughs> we had tons and tons of books. If you're familiar with that argument, you will know that people read millions of books on Marxism in the 70s and 80s. And Marxism with everything: Marxism and education, Marxism and literature, Marxism and psychology, Marxism and astronomy, Marxism, etc. <laughs> But, but the thing about uh, Gonzalez was it really is a, it was a place um, where to socialize. It was a third place. It was a place where um, those networks were recreated through uh, the physical encounter with the book. Uh, so in a way, you, you could say it's like the, the least technological project you can imagine. But at the same time, it was only possible for technology. Because quite honestly, the only reason why I was capable to bring all these books together was through social media. And using Facebook and using other, other for their tools so that people become aware in Mexico. And the excitement of people seeing their books uh, re-emerging in New York and making those connections between the, the book donor. And for every book, we made an ex libris, which is like a little label with the name of the of the old previous owner for the new member, for the new owner. Um, and now actually Don Celes is in Phoenix. Uh, we moved to Phoenix uh, through an invitation by 
the university uh, museum, uh, the Arizona State University Museum, uh, and we established it in a place that is right between the Latino uh, neighborhood and uh, and like the more kind of up and coming like a, kind of a cultural creativity neighborhood. And um, in, 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 the, in Phoenix, in Arizona in particular, is very important because as you know, the, the, the debate on immigration, the issues that we're facing with immigration in Arizona is definitely ground zero for that. So it was very important for me to be able to, to create those centers there. And uh, we still be running it. We actually will, we will run through the end of July, June, and then we'll continue kind of moving it along to other places, eventually going back to New York. But essentially, it's a place of, of interactions with others. So, just to conclude, I'm sorry I'm going to skip a few slides because there's no time. Um, I want to go back to the title of this, uh, this uh, lecture, um, which was Three Chairs for Society. Uh, and you might, imagine, you might think that this is uh, maybe uh, a little strange, given that it was, uh, it's a quote from, from Thoreau, which is not from Latin America precisely. But my whole discussion has been about our relationship with America and with America. And um, the art world, uh, the, the three chairs of the art world, I actually think of them this way, at least by Joseph Kosuth, you know, think about the, the chair conception. But I want to think of the, the, the three chairs socially. <coughs> and I would, uh, uh, Henry Thoreau, in his, in his famous book, Walt, and he writes that we have three chairs, one for himself, one for, one for, for solitude, uh, two for conversation and three for society. <coughs> and um, maybe I'll just quote quickly what he writes. I had three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for, two for friendship, three for society. When visitors came in larger and unexpected numbers, there was for the third chair for them all. Well, they generally economized the room by standing up. It is surprising how many great men and women a small house will contain. I have had 25 or 30 souls with their bodies all once under my on the right roof, and yet often parted without being aware that we have come very near to one another. Many of our houses, both public and private, with their almost innumerable apartments, their huge halls, their cellars for the storage of wines and other munitions of peace, appear to be extravagantly large for their inhabitants. They are so vast and magnificent that the latter seem to be only vermin which infest them. <clears throat> so I think that our new Walden, our new cabin, might be the online world. <clears throat> and the networks uh, are the ones that we are creating for ourselves. Um, I am, of course, not advocating going back into the woods. We're going back into what we call the past that might be for the most part imaginary and might have never existed. But I am advocating for getting a better sense of our place <clears throat> in art and in geography, knowing where we live and where we are, which includes those two spaces, the online and the outside. And the third place, in which both of them meet. Perhaps those are the three chairs that we should think about. Uh, Thoreau also said, only when we are lost do we begin to understand ourselves. And perhaps that is what we need to think about when we try to address the issues that we try to engage with as artists or as individuals interested and invested in the future of Latin America.